So, first of all, thank you so much for coming together and thank you for the wonderful introductions. So, welcome you once again to YM 2017, which is having its ninth edition right now in Goa. So, I am really privileged to have uh, been uh, to be a part of this great team that we have this year. And uh, on behalf of the team, I have the rare honor of being able to give this organizer's talk. So, uh, we will not focus on the title of the talk right now. So, uh, just uh, repeat thank you note again to the team. So, that's Deepa on the left, Sudha uh, comes then, Smita, Praveen, who is not here, he will be joining us in a couple of days, and me, and of course, not to forget the great people we have from the India Biosciences team, Harini, Ritika, Munmohan, Deepti, wherever you, I can't find you. So, it has really been a great journey till now, and I hope we do live up to the expectations that uh, Ron has put us up to. And uh, we will wish that you have a great time in this conference. So, uh, as a, be, or, uh, so a, a part of the organizer's talk goes into telling something that uh, we have done in our labs. And we will, so I will mix this up with a little bit of the scientific content and I will try to spice it up with some of the interesting anecdotes that happened while I started as a young, shouldn't say an investigator, I started as a young faculty trying to set up a lab and trying to get a footing in Indian science. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how many of you remember this thing we had in our childhood. Uh, there was an ad of one paint company. Whenever you think of color, you hear of us. So, I just copied that. Whenever you hear of Goa, you actually think of this. So, this is something which I had to leave up to when, and, and when I went for my first project defense, I mean, the chairman of that committee asked me, so how do you plan to do all this work in Goa? So. Uh, so I took uh, so that as some sort of a challenge, and I tried to continue my work, which I had begun with the cholera germ as, uh, as, as a continuity of that. But initially, things weren't that great. So I didn't have a lab. I didn't have enough setup. So as, all, as most people do, I tried to uh, take out a leaf out of my bioinformatics training. And we tried working on some of the bioinformatics of microRNA. But we are not going to talk about that. Neither I'm going to acknowledge the students very selfishly who did that work. So uh, the next question that I really faced was, what's so relevant about cholera these days? And uh, like I had to always go back to the WHO figure. So right now I have the latest figure from WHO, where in the shaded countries are the ones which reported cholera in 2015. And the uh, uh, dark countries are the ones which have had outbreaks of cholera as, uh, uh, in, uh, in early epidemics. Now, one small difficulty that we have regarding cholera is that sometimes the outbreaks aren't really reported. So right here in Goa, I mean, that view was one of, uh, from one of the famous beaches called Aguara. So there's also an uh, infamous thing at Aguara. There's a prison, there's a central prison in Aguara. And uh, as per our scientific community reads, there was some sort of a cholera outbreak in Aguara, but it was like not really so severe, it was kept under control. But these things weren't really reported so much. Now, the problem with cholera is that you really don't have anything to treat or vaccinate you against cholera. So this is the most popular vaccine you have right now. So it's called Ducoral, and it's basically a mix of uh, some uh, uh, killed oral uh, O1, that's the infected strain of cholera, and also some O139. Now, the problems with this thing is this is very short-term vaccination. The vaccination does not last for more than uh, six months at best. Plus, it has some contraindications, like you have, uh, you have to give this vaccine in two doses, and there's always hypersensitivity to the previous dose in many patients. So all this prompted us to think of something anew. And uh, this uh, thought in me was actually uh, uh, given to me uh, when I was working in uh, Balki Nayas lab as some sort of a young BSc student, and during those days, there was this cholera outbreak in Bangladesh. So the Bangladesh cholera outbreak revealed a very interesting scenario. So till then, we knew that there were two strains of cholera. One was the Eltor strain, which originated from some well in, uh, in, in Mecca or near that, and the other was, the, of course, the classical strain, which was more deadly. Now, the Bangladesh outbreak somehow showed that the more deadly, that's the one in purple, the more deadly classical strain has imbibed all the best things and gone into the Eltor strain. So in Bangladesh, we had Eltor strains with all the features of uh, classical strain. So uh, that was the paper in 2002 from Balkinaya's group. And now we had a germ which could easily cross boundaries and take, uh, and, 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 and take uh, the best out of its various serotypes. 
So what to do? How do we treat cholera, apart from uh, ensuring proper hygiene and other things? So what we knew till now is that the germ actually stays, uh, adapts itself to two different lifestyles. In one lifestyle, it stays, uh, the one which is more famous, that avatar is the one in which it goes into the human intestine, causes, uh, inhibits the intestinal microvilli, and causes loss of fluids leading to uh, the diarrhea-like epidemic that you see. But right now, if you ask me what's the scenario, most places, it's in its sessile, non-infective lifestyle. So you see a calm, I mean, serene water body, and you are not aware that actually that may be inhabited by biofilm-forming cholera, which do not do anything, but once they get a trigger, they can switch back to the infectious pathogenic form. So what we tried to address was, why not try to disrupt this pathway that the germ takes for going from the non-infective form to the infective form. So looking for that, we also were aided by this work by Tischler and Camille's lab in, uh, in, in, in Italy, I guess. So what they did, found out that they did find out was that there was a certain exopolysaccharide produced in the biofilm, which is regulated by a secondary messenger, which is now ubiquitous in, uh, in almost all forms of life, which is known as the cyclic DIGMP. Now, there's something which triggers the GTP inside the cell to be converted to cyclic DIGMP, and that something is imagined to be some extracellular signal, but it's not exactly deciphered as of yet. So we have this class of proteins in most bacteria which have the ability to convert GTP into cyclic DIGMP, and these are known as the diagonalized cyclases. So what we did was we tried and found uh, some diagonalized cyclases in the Vibrio cholera genome, and we chose a particular diagonalized cyclase which also was imbibed with the extracellular sensory domain, which is a pass domain in this case. Now what we did was we uh, tried to work with both the wild type of this thing. So this is how our latest uh, figuration of the domain looks like. So the portion in green is basically the GGEF domain that we are talking about here. And we took turns to mutate each of the amino acids in this thing with, uh, with, with, with uh, bioinformatical treated variations. And finally, we found that this one has definitely has a role in conversion of GTP to cyclic DIGMP. So that's your HPSU profile. And that's the profile on the, of the binding profile of GTP on the right. It does bind to the glutamate and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the other residues over there. So when we found that this uh, protein, which we named CBOX3, is a potent uh, diagonalate cyclase, that is, it can convert GTP into cyclic DIGMP, we tried looking into the mutants of this protein. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the few mutants of the protein that we generated with respect to the position, so we actually tried first with the central residues, then we tried combinations of residues and all that, we found that indeed, if I have a mutation in the central GEF zone, then we can reduce the biofilm formation activity of this, particular, of, of this particular strain of cholera. So what I have here on the left is basically the CBOX3, which has the highest biofilm forming ability. And then you are followed by CBOX5, 6, and 7. Those are the bars on the, on, on the right of CBOX3. So you can see that there's a reduced biofilm forming ability, which we checked both by biofilm forming assays like the, like the, like the crystal violet assay. And we also checked under, the, under a cryo-electron microscope. And we also did the reverse thing, like we saw how motility was being affected, and we saw that the uh, CBOX3 uh, had the least of the motility, indicating that they were the most potent form um, biofilm formers, which were, of course, uh, the motility was, of course, more in the case of CBOX5, 6, and 7. So what we are doing in this lab till now is we are now trying to look into the structural mutants of the CBOX3, that is, we are looking into the uh, structures of CBOX5, 6, 7, and 8, and mind you, this the protein has proved as difficult as the cholera germ. Has been, it has really been a difficult protein to handle and stabilize. So we are still in the process of doing this thing. So um, what I will now do is I will now show you a little bit of the glimpses of what we had faced to come to this stream. So initially, when I joined, I was like hamstrung by funds. And the thing I got was I got some lab space, which was looking like this. So my first challenge was to set up a lab. And for setting up a lab, it was right from planning what would be the flooring on the lab, how much of the AC's blow do we need. And since we were also bringing up a crystallography lab, how much of the dust-free environment can we maintain? So uh, I am very grateful to all my PhD scholars who have helped me to like course through several days of difficulty. And uh, they have walked 
both in places outside the campus trying to get the results because as, uh, there was also the pressure of getting to a result and showing something in terms of work done to the projects. So now we have managed to set up a crystallography lab as well as we have a regular lab. And uh, in this field, I must say that I have been really been helped by one of the most important aspects of doing science in India, which are called collaborations. So we have a session on, we have actually a panel discussion on collaborations in India. So uh, I will uh, be laying special stress on the collaborations that we have uh, been doing right now. So we have been helped in by a number of places, like we have collaborators in IIT Rookie, IIT, uh, in, in IIT Madras, and uh, now one of my scholars is struggling with the structure of this difficult protein and its mutants in BC in Germany. So uh, to cut a long story short, we started from nothing, and we are still scraping at the bottom, but we are still optimistic. As Ron said, if you're pessimistic, leave that pessimism out of the door. So that's what we are striving to do. And I'm sure that someday we, our optimism will hold us in good stead. So uh, it wouldn't have been possible had I not got these great people in the lab. So I have Divya with us here. She is one of the volunteers for OIM as well. And Om Prakash is the one who is struggling at Basie with the crystals. And uh, that's my uh, first scholar, Thiren, who all helped up in setting, setting up the cholera and the structural lab. So that's why the name of the lab, as you see at the bottom, is that's our logo. It's called the Vista Lab, and it stands for Vibrio and Structural Analysis. Now, uh, of course, fundings do play a great role, especially in a private institute like ours. And we are very grateful to the generous funding we got from different government agencies, like the BRNS, TST, and of course, the DBT as well. So. Uh, I would like to end up here. I will not take much of your time. I just want to have and say thank you from one of the visitors in our lab. He comes in at times, and we have to take, make sure that he doesn't reach the crystallography area. <laughs> so that would be it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for once again for being a part of the YM. And uh, I hope you will have a great five days ahead. And uh, we welcome you once again to Goa. Enjoy the scenario, enjoy the beach, but of course, remember that science is the priority over here. <laughs>